This film is dedicated to all places where the haves and the have-nots meet. The outsourcing of American jobs through globalization in the early 1980s triggered a cycle of homelessness in America not seen since the Great Depression. It's because when you're older in the system, it's like you're lost. Don't nobody want you at their placement. You know, if you've had a, a prior incident of running away or something like that, they don't want you at their placement. If so, they try to put you at lockdown yeah, facilities. It's, it's, and it's like, I've been incarcerated all my, all my life because all the events that didn't happen to me, it's just like, it's all happened so fast and like back right. to back, back to back, back to back. Nan Roman, president and CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness, provided a history of the interwoven problems of homelessness at the Coalition for the Homeless Houston Harris County annual meeting held at United Way on February 3rd, 2008. And at the end of the 80s, we estimated that there were about 400,000 people on a given night, two and a half million in here. So by the end of the 80s, we really began to beef up our funding and our systems, mostly federally, because at that time, local governments really didn't want to have anything to do with homelessness. Remember that? Those days when um, I think local governments preferred not to think about homelessness or worried that if they did anything about it, they were just going to start attracting more homeless people to their jurisdictions. So they really, they were not in the game. It was the nonprofits, faith-based groups, that uh, emerged locally, and, and the federal government uh, started funding it. And, and over the next 12 years, uh, uh, we built up a lot of resources and a lot of infrastructure, which you all are very familiar with, into the homeless system. So by the end of the 90s, we had 40,000 homeless programs in the country, and it was costing billions of dollars for us to run this system. And a lot of great things were happening in this system, of course. But the one thing that wasn't happening was we weren't solving the problem. We were, uh, the problem was actually getting bigger. We kept building up more system and we kept getting, strangely, more homeless people. Um, that, that's, a lot of that is because the system that we built of shelter and transitional housing and street outreach and so forth wasn't really designed to end the problem. Uh, it was designed to help people have a better experience of homelessness uh, and to be a platform for them to exit. But it didn't really have any exit strategy. There's a real high level of integration uh, across our programs, uh, emergency shelter, uh, clinical programs, and housing programs. Our objective is to move people as quickly as we possibly can into permanent supportive housing. All of our housing is permanent. We don't do any transitional housing, never have. I've always had difficulty with the concept of transitional housing uh, for kind of theoretical reasons about the efficacy of the model I don't think is good. A person in transitional housing is still homeless because there's a time limit on the amount of time they can be in their apartment. They're not home yet. You know, they, there are conditions placed on them. What we've learned over the years is that clinical and social stabilization occur faster and are more enduring if you eliminate the chaos of homelessness from a person's life immediately. The Homeless Access to Recovery and Treatment Act of 2009 ensures homeless people with addictions and mental illness receive the necessary treatment and assistance to help them recover and to end their homeless conditions. The signing of the Hearth Act in 2009 and the start of the work in 2012 gave the coalition a very clear coordinating role. There is a dynamic relationship between adverse childhood experiences and the quality of life that one is capable of leading. One study, a collaboration between the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente, found that most people suffering from a poor quality of life can trace their symptoms, drug addiction, mental illness, and homelessness, back to adverse childhood experiences. A questionnaire they developed gives respondents a score from 1 to 10 based on their exposure to adverse childhood experiences. The higher the score, 
the higher the risk of negative health and quality of life outcomes. You know, it's one thing to, to read about these cases um, and, and certainly the, the amount of uh, press that's been given to these types of cases has increased hugely over the last five years. But a lot of it is just from seeing real live people who are going through this. She threw me in a fireplace and I remember having burns and stuff. And the people seen us sitting in the car and they seen that I had burns. She didn't even try to take me to the hospital. And they took me to the hospital and I remember them taking us to a foster home. But in the foster home, the boys and the girls were split it up and they were abusing my brother and they were abusing me. That was, I was like- Sexually or? Yeah, sexually. You know, right now, if you get a, uh, if you, they call whooping and spanking, my ass was with stretchy cord, uh, switch that you, that they wrap around it, plants, uh, water holes, whips, whatever mama had got in the hand, had in the hand. Mm -hmm. If you did something wrong, then you can get hit with so why do you think uh, she used those ways on you? Because I figured her parents did her like yeah. that. Okay. And she figured that that was the way that her parents brought her up. Yeah. So she, that's the way she brought okay. her kids up. I had learned everything on my own. My mom gave me away when I was five years old. People I didn't even know, but I was happy. Even though it abused me, but I was happy. You know? But I've been abused as a young child, and it had a big effect on me. And but to this day, I'm I'm a strong person. I can say that honestly. Spider bite that healed up all right. Oh, yeah, she been well there. Yeah, I don't want to leave you. You know what? You probably best thing for you. We ain't doing each other no good. Uh, I love you like you love me, but you know what? It ain't getting no better. All we do is argue, sad all the time. Um, go ahead, girl. Come on. We caused our hope. Of course, they had vacancies, meaning you sleep on the floor. But you could only bring one little duffel bag with you. You couldn't bring anything else. So I brought my watch, my ring, I had a duffel bag, and I had $300 because I had earned some money over the summer. And I'm like, well, that's the only thing that this whole experience didn't take from me. It's taken away my dignity. I'm now very grateful and humble for anything. But you can't take my education from me. They allowed me in where they house you, they feed you, they close you, they, they do everything. You, you go through all their rules, and once you get out of their class, it's kind of like high school, mm -hmm. home ec kind of class, okay. okay? Once you get out, then you go into work faith and you go be prepared to get a job. Well, right before I graduated, I got a job. So I could stay there as long as I needed to get myself on my feet. I was able to save $1,000 a month, and within 361 days of standing on their doorstep, I got an apartment in River Rivers. I understand this is your first experience with homelessness. Yeah. What got you here? Just trying to get everything together and uh, trying to get my social security and disability and I just hadn't been able to do it yet. So you had some health problems? Yeah, got a bad head. Huh? Have a bad hip. Yeah. Uh, were you? Uh, did you have a job or a career? Uh, well, I was a welder. A welder? Yeah. How many years did you get to weld? I worked for a machine shop for about ten years. Yeah. And how long have you been struggling with uh, your health? About a year. About a year? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you, are you from Houston or? 
Born oh. right over here in Little York Hospital. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, have you thought about what things that could be useful for you to help you get on your feet to be a contributing member of society? Well, like I said, right now, I just... Uh, I was told they could help me get my Social Security started, and but if you're not in the program over here, you're pretty much without luck. Okay. So have you tried uh, the Beacon? Uh, I haven't been down there yet. They're really good. So are you from Houston? Yeah, born and raised. So how long have you been struggling with homelessness? A little less than two years. <laughs> In fact, I recently lost my apartment about a week ago. Yeah. What, what was the circumstance for that? I lacked fun. I just ran out of money, basically. Um, just a hard thing, uh, keeping a job, hanging on to a job, or well, medical I, problem? Or? Job, well, I, I collect disability right now. I kind of came back here to seek solitude okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and just try to uh, stretch out this month until the next month. Maybe my finances will catch up a little bit. I just need a little time. But, you know, I, I was kind of planning that I would be, you know, at least in a shelter and kind of having a little base. And when you're kind of working up the transit, it's tough, yeah. you know, and uh, you just can't, all you can do is just kind of stay upright until something happens. And, you, you know, it will. Um, I, you know, I believe in chances. I believe in, you know, things happen for a reason. So something happens. Just stay proud.